It was a night of triumph for the Brexit party, capitalising on national anger with Westminster over the failure to leave the EU. In count after count, their people were elected. Yes! <laughs> and that defined the wider result as a referendum on Europe. It also boosted the Lib Dems into a remarkable position ahead of Labour and the Conservatives. So how to interpret Thursday's vote on the great question of the day? Add the Brexit party vote to UKIP's, and of course many voters followed Nigel Farage from one party to the other, and that gives you just under 35% firmly in favour of Brexit. On the other side of the equation, add up the Lib Dems, Greens and Nationalists, plus the lacklustre change UK, and that gives you something over 40% remain. But Remainers should leave the champagne in the fridge, because when you add the Conservatives to that pro-Brexit column, that puts them back in the lead at around 44%. So Labour's position becomes critical here. If it remains true to its leader's philosophy, it carries the matter for Brexit. If it tilts towards a full-throated second referendum position, then it tips the balance the other way. Tory path seems clearer, drawn by Nigel Farage, closer to a no-deal Brexit position. But for Labour, this vote has already triggered a bitter internal battle. So, how do the parties drive forward from last night's results? Brexit and Lib Dems to maintain their momentum, Labour and the Tories to get back in the game. Our political editor Nick Watt is here joining us. You've just come hot foot from the Brexit party event. What did Nigel Farage have to say? Yes, well this was meant to be a sort of a formal format of a press conference, but as you could see from the pictures at the top of the programme there, it was a much more freewheeling event. Nigel Farage decided to speak in front of his new MEPs. Let's not forget there are 29 of them, which means that they're the joint largest national grouping along with Angela Merkel's CDU CSU party. Now it's interesting, I spoke to Nigel Farage and he said he has absolutely no confidence that the UK will leave the EU by the new deadline of the 31st of October, even if the Conservative Party elects a Brexiteer as their new leader and Prime Minister. So I then said to Nigel Farage, well what about if they elect somebody who's voted against Theresa May's deal all the way through? What do you think of a Spartan, a Spartan like Steve Baker was elected leader of the Conservative Party? Could you do business with him? Well, let's wait and see what happens. I don't know what price you're giving me on Steve Baker get, get, <laughs> getting elected. Um, I think go to the bookmakers this morning, by the way, and collect my winnings on backing the Brexit Party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a good start of the day. Um, but, you know, maybe Steve Baker will win. I can't see it personally. Nick, um, body blow for Labour too. How are they reacting? Well, there's clearly some movement in the Labour Party tonight towards a second referendum. Now, officially, the position is the policy hasn't changed, but I'm hearing words that there's greater openness to the idea of having a referendum whatever the circumstances are. Now, one member of the Shadow Cabinet said to me very simply, these results are catastrophic because Labour voters, who are overwhelmingly Remain supporters, has, as you're reporting, gone in the direction of the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. Now, I'm told that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell know that danger. Let's not forget, in Jeremy Corbyn's constituency, the Liberal Democrats came first. But there is a feeling in the Shadow Cabinet that some of the senior people around Jeremy Corbyn haven't got that message, are still resistant to a second referendum, and there are currently some big Shadow Cabinet guns pointing in their direction. Thank you, Nick. Well, now, look, let's go back and start off with where this vote leaves the government, of course, and indeed the Conservative leadership contest. To guide us through that, we have Steve Baker, chairman of the ERG and self-styled hard man of Brexit, and Rory Stewart, the International Development Secretary and a declared candidate for the party leadership. Welcome, both of you. Rory Stewart, if we could start off. Uh, your uh, proposition, your form of compromise that you're putting forward is precisely what's been rejected by Parliament and the electorate, isn't it? So, yes, you're right, there are three choices here. You can go for a no-deal Brexit, you can push for a revoke, or you can try to get a deal through Parliament. And I believe that the other two are a recipe for uncertainty and delay, and that although getting a deal through Parliament feels at the moment like the most impossible thing in the world, it's actually the surest way of getting this done, and it's the constitutional way of getting it done. You're really 
you really think there's any possibility of still getting this through Parliament? Of I mean, course, why did Theresa May resign if that was the case? Well, I have huge respect for the Prime Minister, but I think, and I was the last Cabinet Minister sitting on the bench with her when she made her final speech when everyone else had left her. But I don't think even her greater allies would say that her great strength was compromise negotiation. There were too many red lines. People weren't imaginative enough. If I've learned anything as a diplomat or in Iraq or Afghanistan, it is that you need to negotiate and compromise. And that's well, reaching out to people like Steve, but it's also understanding that this is a divided country and you do not resolve a divided country by going to one extreme or the other. It doesn't, it doesn't look like a divided uh, field for the leadership because almost everybody else is saying we need to have no deal back on the table. Um, that's the way the party's going, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's the ine inexorable consequence of what Nigel Farage has achieved with the Brexit party. It's what he's trying to achieve. I think Nigel Farage is deeply wrong. I think a no-deal Brexit would be damaging and unnecessary. I think a no-deal Brexit would be deeply divisive. And I think a no-deal Brexit would be very difficult to get through Parliament. So people promising no deal are promising something that doesn't work and that I think will lead to uncertainty and delay, even if they delivered it. Is there something about your candidacy of, of positioning yourself for maybe the next leadership contest, to be the I told you so candidate, the person who comes back when the party suffers a defeat at a general election and says, no, I've been consistent to my principles? No, I believe that I can convince the Conservative Party that the way to, in, in brutal Conservative terms, the way to deliver Brexit, the way to beat Jeremy Corbyn, the way to reunify the country, is by getting a deal, by compromising that you can't bring together a country which is split straight down the middle on an issue like this by going to one extreme or another. So I respect the referendum. I'm a Democrat. I also, as a Democrat, respect the fact the majority of people in this country do not want a no-deal Brexit. And trying to impose that on the country would, I think, be damaging, lead to delay, because you'd still have to get a future trade deal. I mean, what people are not being honest about is that you go into a no-deal Brexit you then have potentially years of trying to get a future trade deal from Europe or the United States following that. All right, Rory Stewart, thank you very much. Well, let's pick up on the, on the no deal point. I mean, uh, it's rejected by Parliament, isn't it? It can't, it can't get through, surely. Well, it doesn't need to get through. So Parliament already voted to exit without a withdrawal, without withdrawal agreement if necessary. When, when Parliament passed an act to notify, give the Prime Minister permission to notify our withdrawal, the terms of Article 50 were perfectly clear easily understood that you left as it was under two years with or without a withdrawal agreement now of course that was well, subject out to extension it is the default yeah. option but, but it doesn't need the point is it does not need an act of parliament to make it happen now no, parliament can vote parliament all chose manner to of vote. things could happen couldn't they like a no confidence motion in the government it is which true that no. even some conservative mps might yeah. be minded so to join that means that the new leader whoever it might be needs to hit the ground not just running but sprinting and ready to go to a general election with their plan for its exit. you really want a general election no, I don't got fourteen percent. I Thursday. absolutely do not want a general election, and actually, I think it's rather ludicrous that some of my colleagues are now suggesting that their first rebellion might be the one that puts Jeremy Corbyn in power. But if they're going to threaten it, if we're going to survive as a Conservative Party, if we're going to regain the voters who we've lost, then we need to be ready to take this country out of the European Union. Well, but I would just say, I of course do want a deal. There's a lot of nonsense being talked. No deal's not an end state. Rory's quite right when he said moments ago that we need to have a free trade agreement. I want to deliver a relationship of the character that the European Union offered us in March well, last year for the whole UK. Let's roll forward with the scenario that you put. Not your ideal scenario, but if you have to move into general election mode in short order, would you favour some sort of compact with the Brexit party? Electro so my, electoral deal, not to contest so certain just, seats. If I may, just to rewind slightly, my preference would have been to rescue the withdrawal agreement, which is why I put so much effort into what became known as the Malthouse Compromise, but that's of course now in the past. Well, so I would have preferred to have rescued the withdrawal agreement and exited smoothly into a relationship with the character they offered us. But I'm not proposing a pact with the Brexit party, no, because I would like to avoid it. But I think there's, at this point, the reality is... Well, they're going to prevent if, you getting any kind it, of workable numbers, aren't well, they, it's, on the uh, current showing? There's no doubt in my mind that if the Brexit party stood in Wickham in a general election this year, that I would lose and the Labour Party would win. And, and, it, and still would, you're saying you'd like the next Tory no, leader to call the general no, no, election? No, 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 no. That's absolutely not what I said, Mark. What I said is that you've got to be ready. If people like Philip Hammond are now implying 
The Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's never rebelled, is now rather ludicrously implying that he would bring down the government and install Jeremy Corbyn rather than allow to happen what was recently government policy. Let's, then if they're going to threaten that, then go you've got back, to be ready to counter. Sorry to, to, to butt in, but let's go back to your preferred option of trying to conclude a, a withdrawal agreement on a, on a revised basis. Should Nigel Farage be part of that? That's what he's asking. So I think it's probably now too late to conclude a revised withdrawal agreement. I think this withdrawal agreement is dead. I think if there's one thing you can take out of these results today is that there's no mandate for the withdrawal agreement. The Tory party campaigned on the withdrawal agreement and it was very clear that we've, we've just been smashed for doing so. So we, we can't resurrect this withdrawal agreement. What I would say is there's a wide range of contingencies have been put, been put in place by both sides to try and deliver a standstill till the end of the year. That can be extended. We can, do, we can notify jointly, if there is agreement, a standstill in our trading arrangements, no tariffs, no quantitative restrictions, for up to 10 years with a temporary free trade agreement while we negotiate a full FTA. We've got the text ready. To, We've got a I'd Irish love to border. Thrash thrash out a deal Mark, this is so important. We've got a free. The people I sh sort of shoal with and have produced a free trade agreement, okay. a border protocol for Ireland, and a defence and security treaty, and we're ready to go. Steve Baker, Rory Stewart, thank you so much. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but time is very limited. Now, of course, these elections pose serious questions for Labour too. In Scotland, the SNP romped home with nearly 38% of the vote, Labour falling back to fifth place. In Wales, a strong showing by the Brexit party and Plaid Cymru relegated Labour to fourth place. And closer to home, in Jeremy Corbyn's own Islington constituency, there was a 21% swing from Labour to the Liberal Democrats. Joining us from Hay on Why is Barry Gardner, the Shadow International Development Secretary. Uh, welcome, Mr Gardner. Thank you very much for joining us from that rather soggy scene there. So has the Labour Party changed its stance on Brexit today as a result of these results? We've heard from John McDonnell. He seems to be suggesting there should be a second referendum. Look, um, the government has clearly failed to secure a deal that is acceptable to Parliament. We're now in the situation where the uh, leadership contenders have made it very clear that they're prepared to countenance a no deal. There is no commission going to be in place in the European Union until November, so there, there is nobody to negotiate with before the date upon which we would leave. In those circumstances, Labour will follow through on the commitment that we made at uh, our conference in September last year, and that is because we are now facing that imminent threat of a no-deal Brexit, then we have to now say that it's time for a public vote, whether tell that me, is as a general tell me election about or whether that is as a second referendum. All right, well, we need that to stop a no-deal. Ah, OK. So, so you are prepared to go for that, because last year you said a second referendum would be a betrayal of democracy. Look, uh, I, I have said consistently that a, going against the first referendum that we are, the, the referendum that we had in 2016, um, would really be to seriously jeopardise people's trust in our democratic system. I still believe that, but the point is this, we are now faced with the, the serious threat of no deal. That's why in September last so, year okay. we spent six hours locked in a room together and we came up with that composite motion and that's no, what no, we well, agreed. It's important. We must now deliver on that because that's what we promised. Well, no, it's important though that you now see circumstances in which uh, a second referendum might well be necessary and even desirable to avoid no deal. Let's just talk about but, but look, the if, position if, of Jeremy yeah, Corbyn. But if you because go back, sorry, if I can, if, if I can just briefly, just point if, out if I may ask you. If you, if you, yeah, no, indeed. If, if you go back to, to the 2017 uh, manifesto, you'll find there that we set out this very clearly. It was that there as a possibility. the referendum result, but, but not, not to accept a no deal and not to accept the, the deal that was going to undermine jobs and security and our just-in-time supply chain let's, and our security as a nation. That is what is now clearly right. manifesting itself because of the incompetence of this government and the failure of the Conservative Party to let's, take the interests of the country first but to put their own interests as a party first. All right, well, let's talk about your interests as a party and, and in particular the position of Mr Corbyn. There's been quite a bit of uh, recrimination, for example, on social media, on Twitter today, people talking about a possible coup. 
Um, you've had the worst results in Labour in terms of the share of the national vote since 1910, uh, following on pretty dire local election results. Why isn't the position of your leader coming under question now? No, the, the clear lesson from yesterday is that the public wants clarity rather than complexity. Do you think, do you think Jeremy Corbyn's forward, policy it, has given it, them clarity? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer your question in my words. Um, the, what we've tried to do is we have tried to set out a process and that process was to try and honour the referendum result by negotiating with the government to achieve an acceptable deal. We couldn't do that. The government kept their red lines. They would not move. As a result of that, one Prime Minister, well, the second Tory Prime Minister has now gone uh, and we're in a situation where all the leadership contenders who won't be in place, let's face it, until the end of July will have no time to negotiate anything different before the new date of us leaving on the 31st uh, of October. In Thank this situation, you. we are following through on the promise we made in September.